A very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today for the final conference of Land is Forever. During our two-hour event, we will be reflecting on the findings of the Life Plus project, which has uh, run for the past four years. And next we will be presenting some policy recommendations. Um, so we will, be study we will be reflecting on the findings of the private land conservation practice in Europe. And next, so we will have a very rich exchange um, with, um, uh, with a rich uh, panel of stakeholders, private land owners, uh, um, policy makers, natural agencies, and environmental organizations, who will be sharing from their rich experience and uh, so we, we, I'm really happy to, uh, to introduce to you a very fantastic uh, lineup of speakers. And obviously, we would also like to hear from you, from the audience. So we, what we have foreseen for you as well is a lottery on private land conservation. So where we, you will be able to test your knowledge and maybe you will walk away today with one of the fantastic prizes which are being put at your disposal. So let me now launch this event and introduce our first two speakers, Philip Tabas and Jürgen Tuck. Philip Tabas is a senior special advisor at the Nature Conservancy. He's a tax lawyer and he, he has been with the Nature Conservancy for 40 years. He has a lot of experience in private land conservation and also econo compatible economic development projects, notably on uh, conservation easements in the United States and also in other countries. And with me here in the studio, I'm with Jürgen Tuck, who is a scientific director of the European Land Owners Organization. And he's also the general administrator of Landelijk Vlaanderen, the Flemish Land Owners Organization, which is active in the field of uh, nature, forestry, and agriculture. So, uh, Philip and Jürgen, when our uh, participants registered, we collected some information on them. And we have a good idea about who is in our audience. So let's look at the profile of the people who are with us here today. Do we have a slide? Oh, yes, sorry, I don't see it. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, when we look at the profile, so we see that 32% are land managers or owners. 31% of you are representatives from NGOs. And 14% are EU national or regional government representatives. 12% landowner organizations and 12% researchers. So a quite diverse and well-represented um, uh, make makeup of pro of of a uh, group of um, of people. Then, when we when we go to the next slide, we also have in information about what do you expect. So most of you would like to find some inspiration. 54 percent want to have a better understanding of the policy changes. Forty seven percent want to understand what the biodiversity strategy means and 45% want to know more about financial incentives. So now we have a good idea about who we have in our audience and also what the expectations are. Now I would like to ask you, Philip and, and uh, Jürgen, what would you like to share with our audience today? And I would like to invite Philip, uh, Philip first. Can we move to Philip? Yes, th thank you. Very much, Amina. Uh, good afternoon and good. Or th uh, thank you very much, uh, Amina. Uh, good afternoon to those of you in Europe, and good morning to those of you who are in the United States. Uh, and I'd let's just like to share a few words about the the project to introduce it to you. Um, I think it has been well recognized that engagement of the private landowners is recognized as an essential element were to achieve the objectives of the EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, this is especially true if we have any hope of reaching the CBD targets of 
thirty percent of protected areas uh, in in terrestrial areas. So it remains vital to continue to attract private landowners and incentivize private landowners to fully cooperate in land conservation with the right policies, the right methods, and compensation mechanisms. Uh, just a word about the, the project itself. The, the overall purpose of the LIFE project has been to understand the needs and interests of private landowners and their preferences, and their understanding about private conservation tools, create a network of European private landowners that are involved in nature conservation, and then to expand the use of private land conservation through dialogue with these landowners and their representatives. Representatives. Fortunately, there is widespread recognition that conservation is a very valuable type of land. In the four-year project, workshops, interviews, web research, that's given us the chance to provide the insights and ideas that have generated concrete recommendations for private conservation. Now I'd like to uh, okay, okay. result developed and to invite the part Yeah, we come by Jurgen Beter Geest. Okay, we seem to have an audio problem. So we will be get back to you very shortly. Sir, yeah. yeah, or is maybe maybe uh, Jurgen. Is there anything you would like to share for the moment? What do we have in the picture? Um, let's say during uh, the meeting, you as an audience will have the possibility to to join us in a, in, a, in an inter interactive way. So I would like to invite you to the participants to take uh, part in, in in a small poll now. You can use your mobile phone and go to menti.com and if you enter the code 53900235, you can answer a couple of questions. The idea is to compare your impressions with the reality of the sector and those answers are based on moderated discussions among private landowners, which we had during 15 consecutive meetings all over Europe in the different EU member states. Um, discussions we had with landowners and land managers uh, in, in those different states. The research itself was conducted by the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy uh, TNC and the European Landowners Organization, ELO. So, I would say, um, go to mentimeter.com, use the code 53900235 and just fill in the polling. And we come back to you with your results and what the final results were, were that the landowners have given. And if our audio problem is solved in the meantime, we can go back to Phil. I don't think so. So I don't know. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, maybe. Just speak to us, Phil. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, no, still audio. Uh, no, I, uh, yeah. uh, Phil, Phil, I think we, st we, we still have a problem. Uh, what I propose to do is that uh, we first have a look at the results of the poll. Very good. Okay, and then I'm just waiting until the first results are shown uh, on the screen, now the first question we asked was how many private land owners use their land for nature conservation, either fully or partly. And you got the possibility to make a choice between 15%, 33% and 45%. And what we saw is that most of you have been voting uh, for the 33%. And indeed, that is also the correct answer because in reality, um, a large percentage of uh, of people indeed are already uh, 
and we are going from one screen to the other, uh, but are making use of, uh, of uh, private land conservation. And in reality, that is 33%. So, indeed, you made the right choice because most of you have made the right choice. The second question and was for private land owners and managers, what's the average percentage of their land they are dedicated to conserving nature? And let's say you had the choice between 5%, 10% and 50%. What was the outcome of the Mentimeter poll? Let's have a look. Can we have a look at the Mentimeter for question two, please? Yeah, here it is. Okay, and you have now the outcome for question two. And there we see that most of you have uh, chosen for the 10%. Now, in reality, it's 15%. So that makes that uh, a larger group of uh, private landowners are interactively in, uh, are involved in private nature conservation compared to what you thought. The third question we would like uh, to give you is what will influence landowners' willingness to participate in a volunt in voluntary conservation program? And there you have a number of options uh, on what you think is the favorite option for the, in, uh, for the private landowner. So that is what you are voting for. And I will need my glasses because the screen is a little bit too far away from me. But so you are going clearly for compensation payment with 44%, followed with restrictions put on the land. And what we see that is in reality, it's restrictions put on the land, which is more important uh, for private landowners, while the compensation is only on the third place for private landowners. The second one is requ the required bureaucracy. On the third place, compensation payment. The fourth is required monitoring. And five is the requirement of giving public access. Fourth question we have for you is what are private landowners' most important issues when engaging in nature conservation? There again, you have a number of options to vote for. And we are, of course, very interested if you do the same as what private landowners are doing. And here we see that uh, you have voted 31% for the unfair compensation for conservation efforts. On the second place, well, I have to say second, third and fourth, you have given equal votes to loss of biodiversity and wildlife, the lack of public recognition and unclear regulations, and 7% each for high taxation and climate change impact. While in reality, private landowners voted for a lack of public recognition with 86%, unclear regulation, 81%, unfair compensation for conservation efforts, 79, and then climate change impact, and only after, high taxation and loss of biodiversity and wildlife. The fifth question is, which financial incentives do private landowners and managers prefer for engaging in nature conservation activities? And there again, you have a number of options to vote for. And again, we are very much interested to see whether you are voting in a similar way as our private landowners did. And you have been voting especially on the incentives for ecosystem services with 31%, and after that tax benefits with 24%, increased market access or products for 21%, reduced property taxes for 13%, and then in the end the access to capital at a favorable rate and the reduced in inheritance taxes. Our private landowners indeed are especially asking for incentives for ecosystem services and an increase in market access or products from conserved land. So there we see that your voting is more or less the same as what our private land owners have been doing. The sixth question was, who do you think is the most entitled organization to, um, to coordinate the engagement of individual private land owners in nature conservation? And we asked you to, we asked you to make one single option out of the several op options we are giving, which are conservation NGOs, national or regional governments, the European Commission, or private landowners' organization. And how are you voting? Can we have a look at the outcome of question six? And there we are, and we see that you have given a majority to the private landowners' organizations, 
followed by conservation NGOs, national or regional governments. Private landowners have given their preference to private landowners organizations, followed by the European Commission, followed by national or regional governments, and only after that, conservation and NGOs and others. There is a seventh question which we did not pose to the individual private landowners, but which we are posing to you, which is according to you, how important are private landowners to reach the EU nature conservation targets? And I think for many private landowners, they will like what they see over here because you have said that they are very important with, with more than 90% of your votes. Thank you, Jürgen, for this interesting analysis. Now let's look at a, at a short video of 10 minutes and look at scalable solutions inspired by the case studies. Land is Forever is a preparatory Life Plus project co-funded by the European Commission. The project collected and analyzed land conservation tools which can be used by individual private landowners. Based on a large set of tools and instruments, the project studied how some of those tools are already used in Europe, or how some of those tools could or should be used in Europe. In this movie, we are presenting you seven case studies. Four of them implementing existing tools, three were tools adapted to fit the legal context in the countries. In this movie, we pay a particular attention how the use of these tools can be extended towards other areas. Let me first take you to Spain. El Castañar is a private estate combining agricultural, nature and hunting objectives. It is having the wildlife estates label. This recognition was the start of many private land conservation projects, including the successful reintroduction of the Iberian lynx. Siempre nos ha gustado participar en esos proyectos. No nos ha eh, supuesto ninguna corta pisa para lo, lo que es la explotación, porque esta es una finca que está bastante explotada. Y yo creo que eso lo importante es que demuestra que, que, que lo que una finca esté explotada, si se hacen las cosas bien, no es incompatible con la, con la biodiversidad, sino todo lo contrario. Y bueno. Another wildlife estate label is the National Park de Hoge Veluwe in the Netherlands. More than 5,000 hectares, it is run by a private foundation. Wat wij voeren in een nationaal park is relatief consistent. Dus uh, wij proberen niet heel veel uh, verschillende dingen te doen. Dat we haaks op het beleid gaan staan van het jaar ervoor feitelijk. Dus we proberen jaar in jaar uit hetzelfde te doen. Ik zeg heel vaak van dat ik het makkelijkste baantje heb van, uh, van eigenlijk misschien wel heel Nederland. Omdat ik datgene moet doen wat mijn voorganger deed. Uh, wij zijn van consistent en actief beheer. Dat betekent feitelijk dat wij de doelstellingen handhaven die we hebben. Uh, een beetje meebewegen op de markt, maar niet al te veel. En eh, actief betekent dat wij actief in, ingrijpen, dus in het bos, in de hei, maar ook in het wild. The first lesson learned is the importance of recognition for private landowners engaging nature conservation. Giving recognition to private landowners when being actively involved in nature conservation could increase their participation all over Europe. Another outcome of the Land is Forever project is the increasing success of tools and instruments when private landowners are joining each other. In order to realize projects on a larger scale, we have seen that in Mazerolle in France, private landowners joined each other to set up a multifunctional landscape combining economic and ecologic objectives. 
Le Marais, il y a une cinquantaine de propriétaires qui sont regroupés comme en France toutes les zones humides. Le législateur a voulu, en 1850 je crois, euh, que les marais se constituent en association syndicale et mettent en commun tous les outils hydrauliques. Les outils hydrauliques des marais, ce sont les digues, les canaux, euh, stations de pompage, écluses. Et donc tous ces outils sont mis en commun dans des associations syndicales. Celle de Mazerol, qui regroupe les 50 propriétaires des 750 50 hectares, euh, s'appelle l'association syndicale des plaines de Madrol. Euh, si on veut faire fonctionner ces zones humides d'une façon durable, il faut y remettre l'homme au cœur des territoires. Also in Sweden, the Polstrup River project was able to bring many private landowners together on private nature conservation at the landscape level. The second lesson learned is to group private landowners and to realize private land conservation projects on the landscape level. The next three cases are studying locations in Flanders. Here new and innovative use of many instruments and tools for private land conservation are popping up because of a nature legislation giving equal opportunities to nature conservation NGOs and individual private landowners. A first case in Flanders is SBNL where a land trust was created in order to support individual private landowners to manage nature bought with acquisition subsidies. We bevinden ons aan de bron van de Slangenbeek. De Slangenbeek is uh, ja, een waterloopje dat uh, heel wat natuurgebieden in Limburg met elkaar verbindt en een aantal prachtige natuurgebieden. Het gebied hier is 10 hectare groot. En we hebben het vanuit de Stichting Behoud Natuur en Leefmilieu Vlaanderen kunnen aankopen met de ondersteuning van het fonds Baya Latour. Het gebied is belangrijk voor de Stichting Behoud Natuur en Leefmilieu Vlaanderen omdat het een eerste reservaat is van de type 4. Een reservaat van de type 4 dat in Vlaanderen de mogelijkheid geeft om in de toekomst gronden aan te kopen met het oog op natuurontwikkeling maar met 80 tot soms 90 procent subsidiering vanuit de Vlaamse overheid. In a second Flemish case we were able to join forces between the Flemish authority and Informa, realizing a circle of farm combined with nature conservation. Nu toe bleek dit vaak niet mogelijk, maar in de toekomst zal dit grotendeels afhangen van de doelstellingen die zullen uitgewerkt worden in het natuurbeheerplan. Van belang is de manier ook waarop Europa haar nieuw GLB en de Green Deal in de praktijk zal uitrollen, als ook de invulling die hier in Vlaanderen aan gegeven wordt. De les geleerd door de vorige twee projecten is dat een equal treatment van individual private landowners en nature conservation organisaties is automatisch leiding to innovative instruments. A third Flemish case is the cooperation between individual private landowners and Fla Flanders' largest nature conservation organization. Het is een moeilijk project en um, het is een beetje tegendraads om te zeggen private eigenaars gaan met natuurverenigingen samen. Ik denk dat dat in de toekomst meer gaat gebeuren. Vlaanderen is te klein om allemaal aparte projecten te kunnen opzetten en toch zeker naar grote projecten. En om dat te doen slagen moeten we gaan samenwerken. Dat is de enigste oplossing. Bringing to 
together the expertise of both individual private landowners and nature conservation NGOs is key to success in many areas. So not by coincidence, this is the main objective of ENPLC, a preparatory Life Plus project exactly aiming at bringing those two different groups of nature managers together. Yes, welcome back to the studio. Apparently our technical issue has been solved, so we're going back to Philip Tabas for the project description. Uh, well, I think it's been made clear that engagement of private landowners is critical to achieving the, the objectives of the EU biodiversity strategy. And this is especially true if we have any hope of reaching the Convention on Biological Diversity target of 30% of protected areas. Um, so it remains vital to um, attract and incentivize private landowners to fully cooperate on land conservation efforts with the right policies, the right methods, and compensation me mechanisms. The overall purpose of the LIFE project has been to understand and uh, assess private landowners' preferences and opinions about private land conservation in the EU member states, to create a network of private land landowners that are involved in nature conservation, and to expand the use of private land conservation methods and tools and approaches in the e European Union through dialogue with these landowners and their representatives. Unfortunately, there is widespread recognition that nature conservation is a valuable type of land management. Um, and this four-year project combines surveys, workshops, interviews, webinars to gather information and insights and ideas in order to generate concrete policy recommendations ultimately for the purpose of strengthening and increasing private land conservation throughout Europe. Um, and now we, uh, you've heard the results of the poll. So back to you, Jürgen. So now it's time to dig deeper into the policy recommendations. And I would like to introduce our third speaker, Tom Andries. He's a project coordinator at Agentschap voor Natuur en Bos, and he will be addressing the policy recommendations uh, for the stakeholder organizations. So, Tom. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for some of you. I will uh, highlight the most important policy recommendations regarding the stakeholder organizations and private landowners. Of course, more details and other recommendations can be found in the various reports of the project. So, who are considered as trusted partners for private landowners independent of their area, size or primary land use? Might come as a surprise for you, but also the European Commission is regarded as a trusted partner. In the poll, however, it was already indicated only 3% thinks that the Commission should take a coordinator role on its behalf. Perhaps maybe for the policy recommendations, we have a slight different uh, result, but more on this later on. Also, governmental and national ministries and private landowners organizations are highly trusted partners. Local authorities and conservation NGOs are also trusted, but a lot of people indicated already there is still some room for improvement. So next slide, please. So. The project uh, recommends the following roles for these organizations in supporting private land conservation. To provide legal frameworks that is key to ensure long-term perspectives. Not only the obvious nature conservation laws and subsequent subsidy schemes, but also other legal frameworks like climate change, forestry and agriculture. But also the EU biodiversity EU strategy, biodiversity. for example, has a long term commitment and thus conservation tools and incentives need to contribute to this perspective. Represent the landowner and communicate on higher levels. Climate change, regulations and high taxation are important challenges to solve. Private landowners consider climate change as a more important problem than biodiversity loss. One of the main issues is that private landowners receive no or little public recognition. Their efforts to protect nature should be more recognized. 
by the different organizations. Build trust and balance in autonomy is also quite important and is a fundamental value of landowners that influences their willingness to engage in conservation agreements or programs. One of the main reasons of opting out of conservation agreements is often based on social reasons like distrust and fear of governmental involvement. So something to keep in mind. Also support knowledge and expertise exchange between all parties is important. Landowners have a strong sense of trust in place. A two-way knowledge exchange is therefore critical to encourage trust and cooperation to build a good working relationship. And last but not least, support in program implementation. Programs should be available in private landowners' language, including have a contact point in their own language as well. Important is also that equal opportunities should be given to private landowners and conservation organizations for equal investments. Finding common grounds is essential step we have set with this project. A cooperation between private landowners and nature conservation NGOs lead to a win-win situation. With all these recommendations, I'm still on the previous slide, I think, uh, we have set uh, also some recommendations to the uh, different organizations we already mentioned, like the Commission. They should provide some guidance regarding protected measures that can be applied voluntarily by private landowners to ensure that efforts contribute in a complementary manner to all existing relevant directive strategies and policies. But also the Commission should set up technical support mechanisms accessible by member states and of course also private landowners to compensate for possible income loss resulting by implementing protective measures. Member states uh, on their uh, behalf should set up individual technical and financial support schemes for private land conservation, including fiscal reforms as well as national measures for conservation and integrating landowners' efforts into national or na regional nature conservation plans. But member states should also set up a monitoring system to measure the impact of conservation practices on private lands as well. And this monitoring could also reinforce, of course, the national support measures indicating that the efforts are truly providing value for money spent. And then the regional and, and local governments should play a role in private land conservation by using the existing communication channels and advisory institutes to inform landowners about the different opportunities and obligations, but also to help them in interpreting the available tools and mechanisms for the landowners who are, who are interested in uh, nature conservation efforts. Regional or local governments should also support conservation efforts uh, by the private landowners through promoting the activities and the results of private land conservations and to reinforce, build a local or regional identity associated with conservation outcomes as well for tourism and other marketing purposes. Regional and local governments could also, in absence of other bodies, take up a coordinating role between private landowner groups uh, like farmers, NGOs, private sector to harmonize efforts and facilitate uh, information exchange between all these parties. These are just a few short recommendations we have for the policy level. And of course, much more can be found in the different other reports of the project. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. So now we'll be going to the policy recommendations on the methods, which uh, Philip Tabas will be addressing. Can I have the first slide, please? I think you need to go back. Yes, so um, to summarize the um, recommendations in, in the study, <clears throat> that were generated for private lands conservation. There are some three basic principles that we have adopted uh, that guide all of the methods that are being recommended. The first is that any of the tools and methods that we're recommending be compatible with and consistent with the landowner's economic and financial reality and be uh, culturally appropriate for the uh, methods that uh, landowners use to manage their land. The second has to do with um, having flexible and um, a, a choice of, of applications 
of various methods. Uh, there's no one size fits all and there's no single approach that we uh, have recommended. We're looking at a, a broad menu of tools and methods that, that are recommended for working with private landowners. And finally, uh, we recommend that there's greater collaboration with trusted conservation partners, as Tom uh, indicated earlier. Next slide, please. We, we have a package of a, a, a about five uh, methods that we're recommending. The first has to do with expanding the use of land trust through innovative relationships uh, developed between landowners and land, land trust organizations. Land trusts are locally based charitable organizations that have as their mission to advance land conservation. Uh, they, these are funded by charitable gifts from individuals and corporations, as well as governmental grants and subsidies. But they offer uh, a number of different ways of providing services to landowners, both in holding and uh, in administering conservation easements, uh, offering private landowners an opportunity to collaborate in how the land is managed uh, to advance compatible uses, and also to take on stewardship obligations on behalf of the private landowner. And there are often ways in which land trusts can collaborate with private landowners to acquire and uh, add land to, uh, to the conservation estate. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, that uh, we skipped a slide, but um, can you back? Can you go back one slide? Thank you. So another uh, recommendation has to uh, relates to the great, making greater use of conservation easements. Uh, conservation easements are an agreement between a landowner and the easement holder, typically a, a, a land trust, that limits the use of the land to economic uses that are compatible with the conservation purposes of the property. The landowner continues to own the land and to manage it as long as it is in ways that are consistent with the conservation easement. The land trust offers services to monitor the land and to offer and to offer to help manage the land in various kinds of uh, methods. The, uh, often the creation of conservation easements is associated with either financial payments or tax benefits or other kinds of assistance in helping to manage the land. Now, many uh, EU member states have begun to adopt enabling laws for conservation easements, and so uh, hopefully there will be greater use of conservation easements to help private landowners in terms of uh, private lands conservation. Next slide, please. Another approach that we've recommended it has to do with expanding conservation contract programs. And these programs are voluntary contracts between landowners and either an NGO like a land trust or a government agency. And these contracts uh, are ways in which the land can be managed for a fixed period of time to provide a certain outcome for conservation purposes. And they often are accompanied by compensation to the landowner to help defray the cost of management. And these having greater access to these kinds of programs will help private landowners defray the cost of management for conservation. Next slide, please. Another tool that is re recommended in our research has to do with uh, greater use of designation of private conservation reserves. And these are areas that have been uh, continue to be owned and managed by private landowners, but they provide con nature conservation uh, out outcomes and are recognized by the public as being designated for their special conservation values. The landowner benefits uh, by uh, l having those uh, activities linked to conservation and habitat uh, uh, objectives. Um, and you're hearing more and more uh, uh, conversation about uh, these kinds of tools. Um, the, uh, in the CBD and the IUCN have identified what are called OECMs or Other Effective Area-Based Conservation Measures. And these are geo geographically defined areas other than a publicly protected area that are managed to achieve positive uh, and sustain long-term conservation outcomes. Uh, these are um, agreements that are uh, provided between 
uh, holders of organizations like land trusts and landowner and private landowners to accomplish uh, conservation uh, related benefits. Next slide, please. And another uh, and the final recommendation that is in the study ha has to do with giving more uh, recognition to effectively effectively using conservation labels and and uh, identifying private private property as being as having been used for uh, private lands conservation. This creates a visible recognition for private lands being managed for conservation, and it often helps to uh, the landowner to market to provide marketing benefits for the the fruits and labors that are produced uh, in the private lands management. The landowner actually commits to managing the land for conservation purposes, but it also enables the landowner to be part of a network of uh, conservation oriented uh, other private landowners. And one of the most well known private uh, uh, labels has to, is the wildlife estates label that's managed by the uh, European landowners organization. Next slide, please. In our policy recommendations, um, we have a number of other design features that in any of the programs that we're recommending, uh, we would like to see provide for greater public recognition of private lands that have been dedicated to conservation uses. Uh, trying to use science and knowledge sharing as a vehicle to encourage greater uh, private landowners to uh, adopt conservation outcomes for their property to uh, provide clear and transparent communication and, and knowledge sharing and, ex and exchange of information. Um, and we want to be able to support um, uh, li liability protections to help defray any uh, issues that might arise through liability issues that uh, occur on private lands. And finally, any uh, private lands conservation activity needs to be monitored to ensure that the conservation outcomes that are being sought are actually being achieved. I think we now move on to the compensation section. Yes. Thank you very much, Philip, for the very interesting presentation. Now we're going on the for the policy recommendations on compensation mechanism. And the word is to Jurgen Tuck. Yep. Thank you very much. And indeed, if you're looking at compensation mechanisms, we see that Private landowners uh, at the moment quite often get subsidies and tax benefits. The question is whether those are the right tools, because what we have seen in our studies is that individual private landowners have a tendency to go for the payment for ecosystem services and preferably on an annual basis. And yes, those annual payments are easy for them to include in their business plans, uh, even if on the long term the annual payment is not higher than what they would get in a one-time payment. Now, if we look at the payment for ecosystem services, it's absolutely perfect that you do that with subsidies, that you do that with tax benefits, but there is also a possibility to come to real market, a real market situation where you do a real payment for ecosystem services. Now, some of those markets are at the moment under development. For instance, that is the case for carbon farming, water purification and storage, and pollinations. Now, markets are based on certificates assessing the economic value of natural investments. And most probably, the future is a blended system of nature conservation objectives on one side and of agricultural objectives on the other side. So on one side, a subsidy for nature conservation. On the other side, we can make use, for instance, of the instruments of the common agriculture policy, including the eco schemes in Pillar 1 and the second pillar subsidies. Now, land exploitations are not always compatible with nature conservation objectives. That's the case, for instance, in arable land. But quite often they can be financed with other financial instruments. That's, for instance, something we see with harrier protection, arable fields, hamster measures, and so on. Now, financing conservation programs with climate adaptation and mitigation funds are other interesting options. I think uh, about carbon storage, uh, but also, also in the restoration of sites, you can make use of green bonds, which can be a very interesting option. Uh, for constant revenues, providing CO2 stockage is also very pro promising. It's something you can do in, in wetlands, uh, grasslands and, and forests. Now, although a great variety amongst active individual landowners exist, their management goals are quite often 
very long term as sustainable nature conservation should be. With a clear and a transparent structure, they can act as the most efficient stakeholder in conservation initiatives and complement the conservation organizations and public land conservation approach, which often depends on a shorter term political system. Thank you very much for the interesting and hope-giving presentation, uh, Joseph. Then we come back here to the studio where we have Thierry de Lescaille and we look, look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you, uh, Amina. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, to discuss uh, what we have been hearing uh, today. Uh, well, I, I'm pleased to uh, have heard that uh, landowners are crucial in order to meet the biodiversity objective of uh, uh, and it would be extremely difficult uh, to do that without them. But uh, landowners, uh, if you want to get uh, them with you on board, you, you need to respect some basic principles. One of those basic principles is uh, the voluntary engagement. If you want to get them on board, you have to convince them. Uh, otherwise, um, it will be extremely difficult. They are resistant to the top-down approach and to uh, the preach. What uh, many member states have already understood as they are offering uh, a range of voluntary programs where they can receive payments and other benefits for their participation to different programs and contracts. It's good, but it's probably not enough because there are some severe treats. Uh, what they do fear when they say, okay, we are delivering a good job in order to protect the environment, but um, there is a trend to offer public access. And if we step into it, we will destroy biodiversity because uh, many times people do not understand how important it is uh, to maintain an uh, area of stillness, what the NGOs of the land managing NGOs have perfectly understood uh, that it is crucial if you want to promote our biodiversity. Broader information, I mean, it's also quite important. They need an appropriate information. And um, what they really need in order to step into this program is a trusted partner. Mm -hmm. And when you speak about a trusted partner, of course, uh, the best trusted partner is the colleague landowner who will tell them, well, there is no, yeah, I'm doing something fantastic. St do the same as myself. So. Private landowners' organizations are offering, but they use tools, they use labels. Uh, we have heard also uh, the situation of the land trust. Land trust could be helpful. Uh, you know, the problem with the NGOs is that there has been not as always a very good relation. In my particular case, we got on personal basis the best cooperation with NGOs at local base, and there was absolutely no problem. But the vast majority of landowners have had to face problems with NGOs willing to acquire the land or to take over mm -hmm. some power. And therefore, uh, those networks, such as labels as the wildlife estates, are there to help to gap the bridge, to show a recognition, and to help them to be proud. To be proud because uh, they can identify what they are doing. They can compare and they can build on exchange of experience. So about um, what they are expecting from institution, but they expect that in terms of application, implementation, and monitoring requirement, uh, requirement should be equal for an NGO or for an individual and feasible, comprehensive. We said already that government programs are too strict or too bureaucratic and many times inconstantly applied and uh, not giving awareness of the efforts realized in the fields. Landowners are concerned also that uh, uh, authorities, uh, uh, public bodies might change the rules at any time in function of change of policies of uh, whatever uh, you like. The European Commission is seen on its way as a um, more trusted partner. But then it's strange because we are facing another issue. Many times when they identify an environmental crime, they prefer to go 
to the European Commission. And the European Commission is saying, well, we cannot do that job. Sometimes if it is really a remarkable of a real uh, infringement of the European legislation, we will really question but um, the member state. But what astonished me is that mainly, in most cases, they prefer to claim to the European Commission than at the local or national level to, once again, to a lack of trust. It's, oh, it's arranged mm -hmm. at local level. We need to go to the European Commission. They will understand us. Also, when the member states are implementing on the true drastic way uh, the legislation, is it about Natura 2000? We remember uh, 15 years ago it has been the case in Flanders, and there was a debate between the European Commission, the landowners, and the government, and things came back to a normal situation, which was quite helpful. So the European Commission can play a role of a mediator. Then we come also for to other situations for the eastern landowners. You know, the eastern landowners, they have recovered their property rights for already 20 years, but it's not a long story. They've been facing expropriation, confiscation, or the political system than democracy. And uh, they say, well, uh, Natura 2000 and the biodiversity policy, it's a way to bring back the old regime we had to face and to cope with 30, 40 years ago. So uh, again, there is a mm. problem of communication and we should be wise to help them to understand that it is about something different. And here again, networks such as uh, the label mm. wildlife estate or other networks as land trusts are uh, quite valuable in order to make sure um, people feel comfortable. So it's about trust. Mm -hmm. We have to avoid mistrust with government authorities. Landowners are afraid also that if they are developing things well, they will be designated under a conservation scheme. So instead of being rewarded, they will be punished for doing well. And here again, we have really to think about rewarding and not punishing, giving a value to biodiversity, and we heard about ecosystem service getting a value, but we should not think in terms of prohibition. We have to have a view on the dynamic and fertile biodiversity. It will be a uh, success for everybody. And then my last point will be the relation with NGOs, because landowners are uh, in many cases case meeting NGOs uh, competing them, of trying to expose them, because that's their feeling. Well, I think it's time, and um, the program we are leading with NGOs shows that very clearly. It's time for partnership. It's time mm -hmm. for a s secure and uh, positive approach. And I have to say that myself, I commit myself personally in cooperating with NGOs in the restoration programs such as my family and my sons. And we do believe uh, it's time to work all together for the best, but also to build trust and also for the public authorities not to act mm. as a, as a uh, punishment body, but as a rewarding body. Thank you very much, Thierry. You're welcome. Very interesting and very positive note. So then, uh, thank you very much, Joseph, as well. We are going now to the, the second panel, and uh, we will be giving some feedback on the policy recommendations with regard to the methods. And here we welcome Judicale Hammond, who is the director at, uh, and, at policy advice at the um, Country Land and Business Association, and Dr. Til followed by Dr. Tillman. Disselhoff and Cecile Merel and Dr. Emilia Laguna. Now, I'm going, I will be pre pre introducing each of you uh, one by one, but first I would like to go to Judicael Hammond and welcome you and give us your feedback, especially your, you are our expert on land trust. Yes, thank you very much, Amina. I hope that you can hear me. Um, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me and I'm going to start with a bit of a, uh, a, a, a perhaps a, a comment that is going to surprise people. We in the UK do not have land trusts as a concept uh, in law or in practice. However, 
We've got charitable trusts as well as family trust st structures, both of which can undertake environmental delivery. Having explained this, I would like to look at the pros and cons of the concept of land trust as described in the report and to consider whether the legal structures that are in place could work in the way which the report describes. I'd like to do this using uh, and, and looking at issues from a dual perspective for private landowners. Firstly, I would like to look at it from the perspective of the desire or the need for control over how land is used as a key asset. And secondly, I'd like to look at it from the perspective of the capacity and skills which private landowners have at their disposal. So looking at capacity and skills first, a lot of CLA members have been engaged in conservation activities, either officially un or unofficially for a while, and some of them have indeed become experts. However, not everybody is in this situation. So land trusts, as described, could bring skills and capacity to the table, which a landowner doesn't have or may not choose to develop themselves. Um, for example, if they do not see conservation as a core part of their business, and this might be the case where a landowner's primary focus is farming or indeed hospitality or tourism. So from this perspective, uh, the concept of land trust and what they might do might work. If we now switch to the second uh, issue, which is control, well, depending on the detail of the arrangements that underpin the land trust, a landowner may have to cede control over the management of the land that is placed in the land trust. The question then becomes for how long and on what basis? So if natural capital becomes, as we expect, a market approach, and I think a previous uh, speaker has already spoken about this, who gets the commercial and indeed the charity that is the tax relief benefits? Is it the land trust? Is it the landowner? Is it a bit of both? So you can see that this could get complicated, particularly if the arrangements are long term and the public policy or the private market changes over that long term, but the land trust is not able or is not set up to adapt. So we talked about the issue of trust, which uh, Thierry has already mentioned. I think it is absolutely critical and trust between landowners and whoever operates the land trust is going to be essential. And for this reason, I doubt that land trusts are a quick solution to incentivize private landowners. Having said that, landowners in the UK can establish their own family or charitable trust to deliver environmental benefits. And this may well be a halfway house to maintain ultimate decision making over what happens to the land and to create capacity and skills and in the case of charitable trust, wider public engagement by creating the resources to employ specialists. And the obvious advantages of charitable, charitable status are tax benefit, which I believe are um, similarly uh, available in many uh, EU member states, and also the protection of uh, the asset against uh, being used for purposes like commercial development in the long term. There are downsides, uh, heavy administration to set them up and to maintain them from year to year, which I believe also uh, would be a downside for land trusts. Uh, they cannot make a profit and the asset cannot be used by private landowners for their personal benefit. So um, as a result of that, we can see a role for land trust. But again, we do not immediately see them as a very attractive or a very quick solution. Uh, we think that other tools and other recommendations of the report are more likely to uh, be uh, to have a, a, a more immediate impact. Having said that, neither do we think that land trusts should be off the table because they do offer opportunities which, if landowners go in them with their eyes open and with a very strong grasp of what the contractual arrangements would uh, have them do, then potentially they're a, 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 a good or a useful uh, tool in the arsenal. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Judy Kael. Then we will now introduce a second speaker, which is Tilman Disselhoff. He's the president of Eurosites, the European network of land conservation. And uh, Tilman, you worked also, also for the UN uh, Agro and uh, Food and Agricultural Organization, for the European Commission and for the German Federal Ministry of the Environment. That is correct. Thank you, Amina. Uh, thanks a lot and good afternoon to our audience. Uh, let me start by saying that I, I fully agree with what both Phil and Joseph has stressed uh, in their presentations. First of all, engaging private landowners is vital uh, to reach the EU biodiversity strategy um, goals. Its uh, voluntary tools allow us to go beyond what's legally uh, necessary, so they go beyond the legally required minimum. Um, and new tools and institutions, and in particular trusts and incentives, are important requirements for involving landowners in conservation activities. And uh, both Jürgen and uh, Thierry have stressed that point. So I'm very much looking forward to the recommendations of the Live Land is Forever project and the subsequent discussions that will come out of those. Um, there's a lot to say about everything that has been said so far. I'd love to have more time to comment on all of that. Um, but I'll just focus on uh, the use of conservation easements in Europe for now. Uh, as you heard from Phil, uh, conservation easements are a way of voluntarily restricting or transferring use rights linked to private property without the transfer of the ownership of the property itself. That makes this tool perfect for a uh, couple of reasons for private land conservation. First of all, it's very targeted. It takes place on a parcel level, property by property. So it gives a lot of flexibility to the private landowners on a local level to decide what kind of conservation measures they want to implement voluntarily on the land. Secondly, it leaves us, uh, as I said, the ownership of the, um, the property with the landowner, something that Thierry has mentioned has created problems uh, in some parts of Europe, if, uh, for example, conservation NGOs or the public have acquired land uh, on local markets. Um, and thirdly, it allows the public to support willing landowners to dedicate a property to conservation in the long term. So it's a very interesting tool. It's widely used in North America, in the United States, uh, above everything else, um, but not so much in Europe. So where do we stand with uh, conservation easements right now? We already know that easements can work for many conservation purposes also within the EU. Uh, we have um, conducted a study, and many of you may know this already, um, in the uh, context of another LIFE project, LIFE uh, uh, ELCN, uh, to develop the European Land Conservation Network. And we, in that case, is NABU, uh, the Nature Conservation Union of Germany and Eurosite. We've commissioned a study to look at the legal basis uh, for the use of easements in the EU for conservation purposes. So we wanted to know if it's legally possible to use this concept in the EU, and the answer is a clear yes. Our analysis has showed that it's indeed already possible in most EU member states to use existing property law for conservation purposes. So this is a creature of property law that is already existing, and we just apply it to conservation purposes. As a second step, we commissioned another study on the current use and on the potential use of easements for conservation purposes. And in this study, we asked over 100 conservation practitioners, again, in uh, practically all EU member states, about their familiarity and the actual use of easements. We are currently finalizing the study and we will publish it very soon. I sound a little bit like a broken record when, when I say that because we've needed to postpone it a couple of times, but I promise we will publish it soon. If you're interested in it, I uh, recommend you to subscribe to the Eurosite newsletter or go to um, our website where we will publish it when it comes out. So you'll be the first to hear about that. But I can already tell you a little bit about what has come out of the survey. Well, first of all, it shows that the most current stipulation in easements as they are used right now is either to dedicate part of the property to conservation. So just set aside a section of it while leave other uh, parts of the property to development or uh, other commercial uses. It's also used for habitat management specifications and for the creation of corridors and stepping stones. And the most common purpose for doing either of those three uh, things is 
uh, as a matter of fact, the protecting uh, protection of Natura 2000 habitats and species, and in particular wetlands and water bodies. There was a very interesting and surprising result that is already used uh, for uh, um, implementing Natura 2000 in many instances. So we can see that the, it's already being used. It has the potential to be upscaled, but it's certainly not widespread right now. Um, so where do we go from here? We need to work on a the familiarity of the tool and on the institutional framework uh, that needs to be set in place to implement it. And land trusts are an important requisite for that. Um, this will increase the willingness of landowners and of conservation NGOs to apply the tool. And uh, um, by the way, if you look at the Land Trust Alliances website, lta.org, this is the umbrella organization for land trust in the United States, you will find a definition for land trust that is very much focused on basically what the organization does. And the organization, uh, any organization that helps private landowners to conserve parts of the property for nature conservation purposes can be considered a land trust under this definition. So I would uh, comment on my previous speaker that we already have land trusts with many organizations or land trust type uh, uh, functionalities with many conservation NGOs in Europe as well. And it may be not be so far-fetched um, to develop the, the model fully in Europe. I'm very optimistic about that. So we need that to uh, increase the willingness um, of landowners and the NGOs to apply the tool, and we need incentives. So what we will do now within the scope of the new LIFE ENPLC project, European Networks for Private Land Conservation, that Eurosite together with the uh, uh, European Land Owners Organization has recently started is we will investigate um, the tool further. We will develop model language for various cases and purposes of conservation easements. So we will produce templates that you um, landowners can apply in partnership with local NGOs. We'll investigate also the um, link to financial incentives, which is really important for landowners that they don't use lose too much money, let's say, when they enter into conservation activities. They at least want to break even or, uh, you know, have to justify their decisions to family members or whoever they feel accountable to. Um, and we will discuss what is necessary in terms of policy changes within the EU and on the national level to improve both the incentives uh, for conservation easements and the subsequent uptake of them by private landowners. So, again, if you're interested in this, Look at our website, uh, enplc.eu, sign up for the Eurosite newsletter, and we'll present updates of that um, uh, to you very soon. And uh, last thing, in December this year, the European Land Conservation Network, so Eurosite, will hold a conference together with the International Land Conservation Network uh, in Barcelona, but it will be hybrid content. It will be all about private land conservation tools and institutional uh, frameworks and policy, and all sessions will also be made available virtually. Uh, to a worldwide audience. So um, we will certainly dedicate also sessions to the use of conservation easements there. Uh, make sure to also check our communication channels about that. Thank you and back to you, Amina. Thank you very much, Tilman, for the very concrete examples and uh, from your experience and also giving already um, some really concrete uh, links for our participants to stay informed about this important topic. Now, we're very happy to welcome the third speaker, Cecile Merel, who, is the co who coordinates the Wildlife Estates label and also is a project officer at Fondation François Sommer. And you will be giving your expertise and feedback on with regards to labels and programs. Yes, uh, thanks you, Amina. So um, I will start my presentation by some feedbacks on the recommendation that we just heard. Um, yeah, most of them recommendations are quite relevant and consistent with uh, what we are trying to do by developing the label wildlife estate in France. And uh, indeed, one point is important uh, to us is to promote the role and contribution of uh, landowners in the nature conservation. Next slide, please. So through the label wildlife estate, like Thierry said, um, main goals are to highlight uh, remarkable estates to support landowner in sustainable, sustainable land management and also to promote the voluntary involvement of private landowners at a local, national and European level. 
and about the benefits for landowners to obtain the label. In addition to the recognition, it's also the possibility to, ins to be inspiring for others. And another thing is the membership in the national and European network. Um, it's uh, allowing landowners to share their practices and experiences and also to have access to information, training and stewardship. And the label Wildlife Estate uh, is in France called Label Territoire de Faune Sauvage. Next slide, please. And it is driven since uh, 2015 by the François Sommer Foundation, the National Federation of Hunters and the French Office of Biodiversity. And today we have uh, 28 estates all over the country, as you can see on the map, and it represents more than 79,000 of hectares. Next slide, please. And all of these estates are concerned by a package of tools uh, and legislation for natu uh, natural conservation, as you can see on the graph, like uh, Natura 2000 or other site classification. And what I wanted to show you with this graph is uh, that the label can can put forward uh, other uh, natural protection tools. And as a showcase of um, exemplary estate management, it allow uh, other landowners to know and to appropriate um, all of these uh, natural protection tools. Next slide, please. So now um, I'm going to present you some uh, inspiring wildlife estate in France. For instance, uh, the Domaine du bois Landry which is a real uh, collaborative experience for a management based on science and a business model, uh, including uh, biodiversity conservation, forest, hunting, and tourism. Next slide, please. And uh, at the Domain du Bolandry, everything started by an observation in 2000, when they realized that there were a poor generation of the forest, increasing loss of biodiversity. So they start uh, to work with uh, several partners like uh, scientists, naturalists or foresters to have a global management based on science and have a overall vision to maintain balance between socioeconomic activities and uh, biodiversity conservation. So as you can see on this nice picture, there are all types of activities on these estates, uh, wood production, uh, ecotourism with the tree houses, synergistic activity with the key species, the roe deer, um, research, beekeeping, etc. And all of these activities are carried out in a functional uh, business model, that is important to say. And so the labelization comes after like a way for the for the owner to gain recognition and to be in the front page of the of forest hunting balance and to be inspiring for others. Next slide, please. And the second example um, is the Lubio Almacé estate in south of France, and it is a good example of a combination of tools. Next slide, please. And on this uh, on this estate. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, on this estate, uh, the owner wanted to, to have the, the return of a wildlife on his agricultural estate. So a collaborat collaborative work starts with the Departmental uh, Federation of Hunters for ecological continuity restoration activities and to make his estate a place of sharing and learning. And to continue this work and to make it uh, sustainable, the owner, uh, having no hair, wanted to have uh, directed tools to protect his work. So a real environment obligation of 99 years, which is a type of easement, was signed between the, the owner and the Departmental Federation of Hunters. And also on the, this estate is part of a regional program uh, developed by the Departmental Federation of Hunters. And the aim of this program is to carry out, carry out a concrete action for biodiversity, and here again, the, the labelization comes after uh, for recognition, to promote the, the owner approach and to be inspiring for others. Next slide, please. So um, to conclude, um, with these two examples, you can see that the, the wish of the owners is really to have a, a recognition of their work and to be inspiring for others. And that is what the label brings to them. And our aim is uh, also to go further by helping landowners to find subsidies and also um, to try to, to, to have a label recognition by the states. Thank you very much.
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Cecile. So then we go to our fourth speaker, Dr. Emilio Laguna, Senior Officer on Plant Conservation of the Generalidad Valenciana, and he's the author of over 800 scientific and popularized papers. And you will be introducing us or giving your feedback with regard, especially with regard to land designation. Many thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Well, uh, many thanks to invite me uh, because uh, I can say I belong to some kind of uh, species in extinction, which are botanists in Europe. So uh, I can express some particular opinions which are maybe uh, not exactly usual for, for your language. Uh, to introduce this topic, uh, uh, we can say that uh, there are lots of very different land designations depending on countries, more or less said nature reserves, but variating a lot uh, in, in the case of, of the regulations. But uh, you can notice that, uh, that uh, progressive, progressively, time by time, uh, this kind of traditional uh, designation need to be complemented by other minor uh, designations which uh, are variating uh, depending on countries. I have chosen uh, one of them to introduce you, where I have uh, developed, thanks to the LIFE program uh, uh, during the last uh, 30 years, uh, which is the Valencian Plant Micro Reserves uh, Model. Please, next slide. Next slide, please. Well, uh, by 1994, the Generalitat Valenciana, which is the regional government of the uh, region of Valencia in Spain, established a, a new figure of protected sites, which uh, could be formed by two kinds of lands. On a hand, uh, public lands are only managed by the Generalitat Valenciana, which is a traditional model of, of uh, nature management in Spain. And uh, on a second hand, uh, private sites, but exclusively proposed by the landowners, not uh, forced against the will of landowners, as uh, traditionally made in Mediterranean countries uh, for private lands when uh, thinking they can be uh, very important for uh, nature conservation. Uh, in addition, this same model of uh, private uh, lands can be extended, to, can be enlarged to uh, municipal lands, but not designated as state forests. So in that, in that case, for the Spanish legislation, they are practically like private landowners, but in that case, the private landowners is, is the, the city town, the city hall. For this second sub-network, uh, the target is not to uh, provide uh, an, uh, a relevant sites uh, to protect very rare or endangered plants, but just on the contrary, is to enhance the protagonists, the leadership of landowners as managers of natural areas. Uh, as a result of that, maybe uh, the quality scientific level of uh, private uh, reserve can be lower, but uh, we are not exactly in, in, in that case searching for fantastic plant sites, but for fantastic uh, sites uh, for leadership of, uh, of our private landowners. Next. Uh, okay. The, uh, no, no, former police. Oh, okay, okay. A plant microserm must have uh, less than 20 hectares on some of their characteristics can be attractive for landowners, such as, uh, for instance, the traditional activities, including the hunting, can be maintained. Second one is, as I say, the legal protection must be proposed by the landowner, not by the government. So the initiative should be fully private. And uh, also the most important is that this designation don't allow to expropriate the land by the regional government. This is a, uh, an important point because uh, um, uh, 
at least in Spain, uh, landowners are recalcitrant, are rejecting the idea that they can offer for uh, society their lands, but the government, if changing or having uh, conflicts with them, can expropriate them afterwards with this obviously a uh, fatal uh, experience in order to attract more and more uh, conservation lands. It's uh, recommended in, in fact that the landowner can draft or contract the drafting of the site management plan. Uh, please, next uh, slide. Well, in case of favorable years, years, unfortunately, at this moment, we have an economic crisis and, and practically all kinds of funds are good. But uh, uh, we have, uh, in the case of Valencia, two kinds of uh, public grants. One of them um, is very interesting because it's to engage the future protection of uh, um, uh, future micro reserves. It deals with a symbolic grant only 10 or 15 percent of uh, of the, the the market value of the land, in order to attract, uh, avoiding to attract uh, the the so-called grand hunters. So please notice that to perceive this grant, the landowner must uh, be strongly engaged with plant conservation. But uh, there is a second uh, kind of grants. Uh, which uh, try to enhance the leadership of uh, private conservation. In this kind, our government can pay up to the 100% of the conservation tasks made by the landowners, not only for plant conservation, also in the, the same place, uh, for instance, uh, adapting the, 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 the site uh, for environmental education, etc. And this grant can be repeated in time. Next uh, slide, please. What's the current status? At this moment, we have uh, 312 legally protected micro reserves. 73 of them are joining the private and municipal model. And in fact, uh, 42 micro reserves, so the 13% of, of total, are fully private. Uh, so you can think that the, the conditions uh, uh, marked by the Valencian law are uh, quite uh, strong, but in any case, uh, there are lots of landowners interested to protect their lands, not only to perceive uh, economic compensations, but thinking they will be the leaderships of uh, their own conservation in their lands. Next slide, please. Next. OK, to learn more about the uh, plant micro reserves, which is a figure which has been exported to other countries, like uh, some parts of Greece or Cyprus. Also, there is uh, there are uh, projects in Bulgaria, for instance. Uh, we recommend uh, to uh, uh, inform you uh, with uh, a book uh, edited by the uh, Life Project Plan Net uh, CIA, uh, edited uh, from Cyprus. Uh, and the project web website you can uh, see here uh, will give you uh, possibility to download uh, download freely the, the book. Uh, for any queries and questions, uh, you also can can contact me directly in my email address. Next. Uh, OK. Many thanks for your attention. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilio. Now we're coming back now, thank to the studio, and it's time for our lottery. So let's see when we get a a slide. So a warm thank you to all the speakers. Yes, it's time for us for doing for conducting the lottery. So this will be what we will be. We have se uh, several prizes. I would like to invite you while I go over the prizes to connect to Mentimeter.com and to give in a code so that you can take part in this lottery. Uh, so Mentimeter menti.com m-e-n-t-i dot c-o-m and enter the code 
5829-9183. While you do that, let's let's first look over let's I will go with you over the lottery prizes. This is what you can win when you test your knowledge. Prize number one, three nights at a farmhouse at the Hoge Veluwe in the Netherlands. Prize number two, two nights in a lovely hut on the water at Mazerol, France. Prize number three, a boat trip and picnic by the stream with a cozy night in Tulstorp in Sweden. Prize number four, a nature reserve visit by day and a tree tents by nights in Belgium. And finally, prize number five, a private flight in the NATO airfield and BNB in Belgium. Now, all the prizes are valid for two years and for two persons. More information will be found on the website itself. So I invite you now all to, to I hope that you have started. <laughs> we will go over the questions together that you're connected to Mentimeter. And uh, yeah, then let's see who wins one of those beautiful prizes which have been put at your disposal uh, by the generosity of the landowners and managers who are involved in this uh, beautiful case studies. I see that it, it's operational. So let's go to the first question. So you have 30 seconds to answer each question. Question number one, land designation as an effective tool for private land conservation is a, the landowner is constrained to submit the land as a private reserve. B, the landowner voluntarily submits the land as a private reserve and agrees on a long-term commitment. And C, the landowner voluntarily submits the land as a private reserve and agrees on an annual commitment. Excellent. So we go... Yeah, number two was the right answer. We have five good respondents. Then we go to number question number two. Labels. I will wait until it loads. Okay, labels for private land conservation. A. Don't give the possibility to reward private landowners for their conservation. B. Is the same as species conservation programs. And C. Give the possibility to reward private landowners for their conservation activities. And the right answer was, was C. And we have 18 correct answers. Give the possibility to reward private landowners for their conservation activities. Now let's go to question three. So which of, this, of these sentences is false? A. Many of the individual private landowners tend towards one-off payments. Many of the individual private landowners have a preference for annual payments and tax benefits. Many of the individual private landowners tend towards payments for ecosystem services. So we're looking to the sentence which is false. And the correct answer was number A. Many of the individual private landowners tend towards one-off payments. So now the last question is which prize would you love to win? One, three nights at the Hoge Veluwe in the Netherlands. Two nights, two, two nights on the water at Mas... Oh, you already <laughs> selected <laughs> in France. The boat trip in Sweden, two nights in the tree tents, or a private flight and B&B in Belgium. And you're still, let's see. A smart one. Yeah, that's, uh, they're, they're all fantastic, the innovative case studies. All right, okay, perfect. You're still counting.
Okay, now the winners will be announced at the end of the conference. So we will get back to you. We will get back to you with the, we will come back to announce the winners. So it's time now to go to panel number three, the policy recommendations on compensation. Hello, yes. Hello, Bella. So we first would like to introduce our first speaker, Bella Jankovic de Jesenice. I hope I pronounce your, your name correctly. Is active on the crossroads of agriculture, the environment and technical and social innovation. He's a head of operations of the family-run Jankovic Burtok Sustainable Estate in Hungary. Bella, we look forward to hearing your feedback as from the point of view of agriculture on the compensation mechanisms. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to share that. Uh, if I can have my first slide, please. So I thought it's good to give some background on what we are doing, uh, because uh, actually five years ago, we participated in an ecosystem services program, uh, which actually was quite successful. So I would like to actually share a success story with you uh, as part of the feedback on the recommendations. So um, it's a mixed farm which we are operating, um, and we uh, adopted several regenerative farming practices. It's now a buzzword, but five years ago, not so much. Um, and actually, if you look at this list of activities, uh, you can also classify them, to my understanding, as ecosystem services. And that's exactly what we did so five years ago. But please, uh, the next slide. Um, just we go one step back. Uh, how we look at this in a more philosophical approach. Um, I would say some eight years ago, when I was walking over the fields of uh, our estate, I thought that we are not uh, on the right track. Uh, it was uh, actually it went quite well farming wise, but the erosion or biodiversity, the direction I was, uh, I was not convinced about. Um, and I went to search for a approach for a philosophy, and maybe for the 67% of uh, participants today who are looking for inspiration, it's maybe something to look up, because this is an approach uh, developed by Common Land uh, that does large scale uh, landscape restoration to have a more holistic look at your uh, at your at your management of your landscape, but it also applies very much and very well for your estate. So uh, we decided to uh, not only focus on the return of financial capital, obviously, but also on the return of natural capital and social capital, and that results in the return of inspiration. Um, the second part of this approach is that we, um, we divert the, uh, the, the different areas of the estate in an economic zone, where it's basically uh, uh, conventional uh, arable land, uh, the combined zone, which is more extensive, and the natural zone, which is totally given back uh, to nature. And we have a plan for 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with this approach in mind, uh, maybe that's also a good point to make, because first you have to get inspired to get into this kind of direction. Then I was actively looking, uh, where can we uh, find a way to make this into practice? And luckily, uh, some four years ago, uh, there was this agri-environmental subsidies. And now we talk, of course, about ecosystems. This is a five-year program. Uh, and I think that's also a very good time frame, five years at least, uh, where annual payments are given. And I have now two slides to give you an example how this works really well for us. Uh, the first one here is uh, with the, the, the typical measures in ecosystem services, for example, uh, limited cultivation on erosion prone areas is just one example. And you see several here, and this would give us a, a standard compensation uh, per hectare of 40 euros. And we go to the next slide. Uh, here, uh, I think, is even more so re uh, relative to ecosystem services. For example, uh, we chose for, and this is all on a voluntary basis, it's a kind of menu uh, way how this worked uh, in, in uh, this possibility in Hungary, uh, is what do you choose? We choose this whole uh, selection here. Uh, I've, you can say first on area-based and then works on inputs and planning and testing. 
uh, we chose for uh, to have 15% uh, of all our arable land into a, a cover crop, or actually it's a soil improvement crop that is standing for five years. So basically we took 15% of our arable land out of production for five years. And of course, uh, for long term, we all know that it improves the soil and improves uh, also biodiversity. Uh, but here the costs go ahead of the benefits. Uh, so here you see for that, uh, uh, the, uh, this program uh, gave 80 euros per hectare per year. And you, you can also have a look at the other possibilities that we choose for. So altogether, it was quite a, a complete a possibility to choose uh, for those, those uh, uh, interventions, those ecosystem services that really resulted into uh, a, a, a wider biodiversity. And I can confirm that that's the good news maybe of today, that after four years, um, having done this, uh, and one of the main takeaways, which is almost funny, uh, is that um, in these alpha alpha fields, we have a lot of mice development. And of course, mice is a very important part of the food chain of uh, ecology. So uh, in this sense, we, a lot of animals were attracted, um, or actually the mice were feed for, uh, for example, foxes and jackals that we also have. Uh, that means that many other animals that these foxes and jackals hunt for um, survived. So if you go now on our fields, you have, see a much wider biodiversity because of uh, this measure and actually quite an unexpected um, uh, answer of that. But the other important part, of course, is the, um, the flowering for bees uh, and, and the, the kilometers of strips we have, uh, which we don't mow. Um, and in this way, have a much better pollination uh, function also in the fields. So it was just to give you an indication of uh, ecosystem services that works in practice, and I can only report uh, in a very positive way. The next slide, please. Just on a side note, uh, I found it very important also to understand the zero baseline of biodiversity. I'm still surprised to date how difficult it is to measure your ba baseline of biodiversity, and for that reason, created a, a field guide. Uh, where we list the, the ones we know, uh, and also some other activities we do in the, in the fields. The next slide, please. So to finish up, um, uh, I, I completely agree that knowledge is very important. Um, I also see the role of land trust there. Uh, the easements, um, since I like to keep control of our fields, the easements are a bit further away for, uh, in my view. It has to be voluntary. Uh, it has to be a long-term commitment, but with an annual payment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vela. It was very interesting, this case study's personal experience. So let's go to the next speaker, Bernard Boudil, who is the Secretary General of the Austrian Association of Land and Forest Owners, and he has an education as a forester. He holds the position in the cabinet of two of two federal ministries of agriculture, forestry, environment, and water management. And he's an expert in policy and forestry. And you will be giving some feedback from your expertise, the field of forestry. Welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Amina, for this nice introduction. And welcome, everyone in the audience this uh, late Monday afternoon on a very important and interesting discussion about conservation and compensation. Since I'm uh, one of the last speakers today, it might be a bit tricky uh, to keep you attentive, but let me have a short uh, advertisement. So the next four minutes might be the most important ones, maybe not of the afternoon, but at least for the next four minutes. So I was ordered to uh, stick on the forestry issues and I would love to do that. Uh, also, most of my members deal with both agriculture and forestry issues. So the first slide is already shown. Uh, what is the political situation in Austria? And it might be uh, the same in most of the member states, but nevertheless, I the analyze for Austria. So there's currently a high demand for conservation measures and areas. But we shouldn't forget that in the same time, there is uh, a high demand also on other issues, which are with an economical and ecological, a recreational a climate change, and in Austria, especially as an alpine country with a uh, land protection background. So all these uh, demands come together 
And uh, today it is uh, the daily business of our landowners to deal with all these demands and bring them under one head. In Austria, the efforts of the landowners are taken for granted, which means that uh, the, the majority of the society and unfortunately also of the policymakers, uh, they uh, live in this, let's call it old fairy tale, that uh, ecosystem services can be provided for free by landowners. And this was true in the past. In Austria, we have even a term for that, which is called in forestry, the backwash effect, which means that the forester was able, or the forest owner was able uh, to live from his business, his main business, which is uh, dealing with timber. And uh, beside that, he was able to provide uh, all these uh, different and uh, multi-purpose ecosystem services for free. But this is not any longer the case, and we'll come to that later. We experience uh, in, in between nearly daily an increasing uh, of the regulatory policies on EU level and also on national level uh, when it comes to, uh, to gold plating. And this is uh, the main problem we face because uh, at the time you have a regulatory uh, aspect uh, above this ecosystem service, there's no legal way to get an income from that. O only if it, is, uh, if it is mentioned in this uh, regulatory, which is uh, normally not the case. So, um, before I come to the next point, uh, I would like to have uh, a, a point on the definition. We have to, uh, to look into the deep between ecosystem service and ecosystem service provision. There is a difference because uh, I think in future it might be tricky to get an income for ecosystem services because this is something which nature provides by nature. But ecosystem, ecosystem service provision means that there has to be an active management by the landowner and by those who are managing these areas and they get granted for this management. It doesn't mean that this management has to be, uh, let's say, very economically. It can be also management for nature areas. So, and when we come to uh, political discussions, I think we should uh, be more strict on this uh, difference between ecosystem service and ecosystem service provision. Um, what are the needs? Uh, the needs, uh, before I come to the needs, I would like to point out that in Austria, I can, uh, yeah, I can tell for mainly all my members that conservation measures are part of a holistic, sustainable, integrated way of land management concept. And even if it is a part of this integrated uh, uh, management concept, uh, the amount might be different to the amount which is demanded nowadays. So uh, the needs are that the discussion of conservation in the context uh, should be in the context of SFM. SFM is the short uh, for sustainable forest management. And as I pointed out at my beginning, there are so many demands. And in Austria, we have a quite strict uh, forest act, which says that we have to provide and deliver many, many different uh, ecosystem services, which is sustainable forest management. And we need this multifunctional approach. And uh, we need obligatory compensation instead of regulatory policies. I uh, talked about this before. And we need a fair income for landowners. Um, and I think it's even a claim or a request that we need this income because if the forest owner is not any longer able to live from the economic uh, aspect of his areas, he won't be able uh, to deliver ecosystem services, not for free and not for money. So uh, when it comes to compensation, to the term compensation, I think we should also think about what does it mean? Is compensation only the compensation for this part of management we are doing? Or is it uh, only compensation, let's say, for, for the lack of income? Uh, I think it should be both. Uh, we, we need for these areas we can't live from uh, also a kind of income component. And this is something we should uh, have in mind when we come to the political discussions in future. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what kinds of compensation mechanisms are there in Austria in place? And I collected the five most important ones. The first are the Naturweltreservate, the natural forest reserves, uh, which is uh, guided by, uh, by the state, uh, by the uh, Department for Forestry in the, in the ministry and the relevant ministry. <coughs> and uh, these Naturweltreservate, they are from a certain size, uh, not too small, but not too big. So starting by 0.5 hectare and yeah, up to up to 10, 15, 20 hectares. And uh, yeah, they are compensated. And uh, the compensation uh, changed in the last years. So it was compensated by national uh, money in the past, uh, in, the, in the time where there was not uh, enough national money uh, in the in the pocket of the government, uh, they this was paid by the rural development by the second pillar, uh, by the rural development program, and nowadays it's uh, paid once again by uh, by the government, uh, which is uh, the better way because uh, when you do it by government, uh, you can have uh, more long term approaches, and this is something you and Tuck are related already on that. Uh, which uh, should be in the interest of a uh, forest owner. The next is the BIOSA contract-based nature conservation program. BIOSA is a forestry NGO and it's dealing with this contract-based nature conservation programs and there are different types of areas. There are these BIOSA areas uh, which uh, are from one hectare up to 120, 150 hectares and the specific is that uh, Forest owners, uh, which participate in the program, they don't get money for it. They do it for free and they even pay for uh, the membership at Bioza. So they are members of Bioza. And they do it for different purposes. So they are doing marketing with that. Uh, they maybe just love to have these areas at their place. And, uh, but for sure, uh, they all are uh, aware that. Uh, that conservation areas uh, essential part of integrative land management. So the, on the other side, there are Naturwaldzellen, uh, which are small areas and they are pay, paid by the provinces. And this is good money, but unfortunately, uh, since now it's only uh, possible to have these areas in one of our provinces of our mind. So maybe uh, we can uh, have other areas uh, or our provinces uh, in the, in, the, in the future, let's see. And uh, Bioso is also dealing as a kind of supporting organization uh, for the ministry. And in this uh, context, they are dealing with this Connect for Bio Stepping Stones Habitats, which is not that old. It started a year ago, and uh, we have already the, the third, uh, the second, the second, uh, yeah, the second pillar of this Connect for Bio uh, Stepping Stones Habitats. And in, in this uh, framework, you can only participate with uh, quite small areas, so 0.5 to 1.5 hectares, and uh, you get a compensation, but this compensation is uh, quite limited. And uh, yeah, so it's, it doesn't uh, fully uh, bring you the money you could have maybe for other purposes. Um, the fourth uh, compensation mechanism in Austria is uh, the measures of the Rural Development Program cap uh, within the cap, uh, which you have also in other member states. And this um, this uh, program uh, comes more on small areas and more to specific manners, so uh, me measures. So uh, not really to, to huge areas where you get a comp can get a compensation and also these contracts for, uh, for a longer time. So normally you have it at least uh, maximum for seven years, uh, which is the period of the development program. Uh, but yeah, nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a, a good, a good uh, thing. And the last uh, thing is uh, increasing interest uh, from private companies. Uh, often these are companies dealing with uh, fossil products uh, and they have these greenwashing projects where they come to individual forest owners and try to get a contract with them so that the forest owner compensates their uh, emissions uh, by yeah by reforestation and by thank you very so i'm already at the end yes um, thank you very nice would you
would you please like uh, uh, wrap uh, wrap up and present us with yeah. your conclusions? Yeah. Uh, can I, thank can I you. The last slide. There are three conclusions, and it's quite short. So, uh, the summary means that landowners. Next slide, please. That landowners are key for conservation measures. That the area use has to be discussed at eye level under consideration of sustainable forest management, as I pointed out already. That. Uh, obligatory and fair compensation is crucial. And last, that uh, yeah, uh, reflecting climate change in future uh, approaches uh, with dynamic aspect has to be considered because uh, active management will be necessary instead of set aside or maybe uh, uh, non-management uh, areas to bring our forests in a climate fit future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I will give the floor now to Alan Phillips, who is the owner of a beautiful forest and nature reserve, Scherpenbergen de Hutten, which is part of Natura 2000 and takes into account ecology, economy and social aspects. Alan, we look forward to hearing your feedback on the policy recommendations on compensation, especially with regard to nature. Thank you very much. It's very difficult to be the last speaker after such qualified speakers before me. But uh, Belgium is a small country and the Flemish region is very overpopulated. So there's not much, not much land left for nature. But in fact, in the past and also now, most of the qualified and beautiful land and biodiversity are in the hands of private landowners. Of course, NGO has, are doing well, uh, authorities are doing well, but without the landowners, I think a lot of would be lost. But in the past, it was only the landowners that were doing their job to keep biodiversity. So that was my first thinking. I have the chance to have an estate in the north of Belgium, called region called the Kempen. It's a ra rather sandy region with lots of dry land and wet land. I have a chance to have 100% of the estate in Natura 2000. Some landowners would find that a bad luck. I find that good luck. <laughs> I have a long tradition of nature management. It is in the family, and I love it. I don't think a private landowner would enter really deeply into nature conservation without having an interest, a, pri a personal interest. Mm -hmm. You must love that. Otherwise, you don't do it. You don't keep an estate if you don't like your estate the same way. So... Uh, for me, the new rules, the new rules that are established since 2017 in Flanders, gives lots of opportunities. Uh, the frustration that a landowner had before is that if he wanted to enter into nature conservation, he would receive just nothing. And the, the next NGOs would, that were doing the same as him, would get a lot of money. So this has changed. So if the private landowners in Flanders want to do something for nature, he gets the same reward or the same compensation as uh, an NGO's. It doesn't mean that there are no cooperation between, of course, private landowners, authorities, and NGO's. These are very, very important because the land is small, we all there on the same region, and we have to, to cooperate a lot. But what is important for a landowner is also the long-term commitment. It doesn't mean that today you get something, and within 10 years you get nothing. It's a very long term. Now, let's come to the compensation themselves. There's a compensation first to make, to establish, uh, nature management plan. So you can use uh, some specialized people to establish your plan, but you have to keep hands on that. You don't have to 
allowed all the pressure from the, for, from the authorities to, to just establish what you want. But the financials are there to establish this, this plan. The second compensation are yearly. Compensation for the type of habitat that you are going to, uh, to do. Of course, you get more money for something that is difficult to manage than something that is easy to manage. One comment on the compensation is that most of the compensation are foreseen to cover the cost of keeping the land and the biodiversity, not much as a revenue for the landowner. We should not forget that if you want to take land from agriculture to go more for natural reserve, you should get a compensation for a loss of revenue. Uh, in my states, half of the property is forest and the rest are open fields where there were in the past many farmers. I took everything in my hands and 100% is dedicated for nature conservation. But it is a loss of revenue. I could rent that to people for a higher price than what I get for nature conservation. And uh, so this is a, a topic that has to be kept in mind. And because on the long term, the sustainability of uh, a project like that depends on how the generation, the, the next generation, will be involved in, in this project. And the next, if I like what I do, I hope my son will like it. But if for him it's a cost or, or no revenue, one day he will just say, I forget it. And I hope not, because I would like him to follow me. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, inter very interesting, and I, I feel your passion for the nature. So I would like to thank hereby the, th the last panel of speakers. So Ellen Phillips and, uh, and the Bella Jankovic and Bernard Boudil. Thank you very much. And it's time now to wrap up our conference. And I see we have, we are going to announce also the winners of the lottery. I don't know where we, are we back in the studio? Yes. We are, we are back online? Okay, let's, let's, um, let's first uh, announce like the lottery prizes. So we see we have five winners. Prize number one, three nights at the farmhouse at the Hoge Veluwe in the Netherlands goes to Anne van Hemeulen. Uh, the prize number two, the two nights in a lovely hut on the water at Mazerolles, France goes to Laura Jelinek. Prize number three, a boat trip and picnic by the stream with a cozy night in Tulsa, Sweden goes to Arnoud van der Vivere. And prize number four, a nature reserve visit by day and a, a tree tents by night in Belgium goes to Aurélie Belvez. And the prize number five, the private flight in the NATO airfield and BNB in Belgium goes to Aurélien Lurquin. Congratulations. <coughs> Enjoy your stay. And well, we hope it will also give you an experience of these innovative case studies and make it even more real for you. So then I would like to wrap up this conference and see what have we learned today. There were a couple of things that really stood out that were brought out a couple of times by different, different panels of our speakers. And the importance of trusted partners was something that was really relevant. Also the, the need for finding inspiration uh, lots of the landowners, but also environment from all different aspects. Eh? Was it the, the, the policy makers, agencies, we were all looking for inspiration. And you were mentioning it and um, uh, our, um, this is, um, our speaker, which was super interesting, Bella Jankovic was mention mentioning it. When you have inspiration, you find a way to do what you want to do. Then also, Cherry, what you were mentioning was we should have the same 
rewards as NGOs. Yeah. We should, as landowners, we are essential for biodiversity protection. So we we need to have be put at the same at the same uh, level. Instead of being uh, penalized, we also need to have like, the same rewards, which incentivizes us yeah. more. And um, this long-term commitment that you have as a landowner, which is perfect for biodiversity, uh, uh, well, the sustain sustainable biodiversity development, and the voluntary aspect. So, and the recognition of the efforts by landowners. So, I heard a lot of things, themes that were recurring, and I'm very happy as well. Well, Tilman was already mentioning it about a European network for private land conservation, which would be a follow-up project. So really building on this momentum and of this powerful community of stakeholders who each bring their expertise to the table. So this, this, I think, is very, very, very positive. And I understand that you will be using the existing networks of ELO for the landowners yeah. and for the nature organizations through Eurosite to continue streamlining the efforts on private land conservation. Definitely. Definitely, and uh, that this new project will also contribute to developing a framework to showing, to recognizing, increasing the contribution of private land conservation to the EU biodiversity targets and enable and facilitate this, this uh, knowledge transfer yeah. between the, the, land, the land owners and the nature NGOs and this in both directions. So on this very positive note, I would like to conclude this, this very insightful conference. Thank, thank you all for watching, for being with us today. All further information will be uh, posted on the website. And have a wonderful day. Thank you for being with us Thank you, Amina. Thanks a lot.